everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Eagle. I invite you guys to come on in. If you'll stand, we're going to go ahead and open with worship this morning. So, dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and we just um, confess our need for you this morning, Lord. Lord, we know that we are empty without you. So, Lord, we just lay our mornings, we lay our weeks at your feet, and we just invite you, Lord, to come and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, we just, Lord, you know our burdens, you know our struggles, and during this holiday season, you know, some are just struggling more than others, Lord, and you know our deepest parts in our hearts, Lord, so we just lay them before you this morning, and we just ask that you would come and fill us, Lord. We need you, and we just give you this time of worship as a sacrifice of praise, Lord. We lift you up and we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
there's none like you. You are awesome in power and might, and we worship you this morning. Lord, we lift you up. We come to you, Lord, because you are greater and stronger than the world. You are greater and stronger than any sin or anything that we struggle with, Lord. Lord, we worship you. We lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen.
that you would be glorified in all that we do and all that we say and all that we think, Lord. Lord, that we belong to you and to you alone. We worship you, Jesus. Everyone stand for our last song.
are so amazed by you and your presence. Lord, that you would choose to die on a cross so that we could know your presence right now. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we do just ask that you would have your way in us, Lord. Give us ears to hear your voice this morning. Whatever it is that you want to speak to us, Lord, let us be willing to hear and to listen. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll go ahead and take this time and say hello to someone sitting near you. Good morning, Calvary Eagle. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> and we hope you all had a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you're visiting with us today, we welcome you. And uh, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to grab a, a visitor's packet out at the visitor's table in the uh, lobby. So welcome. I have the pleasure of doing the announcements this morning. So if you turn with me in your bulletin to, you'll see on the left side of your bulletin there that we have a variety of opportunities to share our love for Christ and share our love for each other and to come into fellowship with each other throughout the week. You'll see that we have home studies and women's studies and men's studies and high school studies and, and celebrations this week as well. So... Uh, invite you to join us in those. <coughs> Turning to the right side, we have our, our Acts 242 fellowship. We'll resume again this Wednesday back in uh, Daniel. I believe we're in Daniel chapter 9 this week, so come join us at the Senior Center in Eagle. There's a women's cr Christmas lunch on Saturday, December 16th from noon to 2.30, and the cost is $5 per person. I'm sure you can get more information in the lobby. Uh, the next Young Lady Studies is uh, coincident with our Wednesday fellowship. So that's also at the Eagle Senior Center. There's a Women's Jewelry Workshop Saturday, December 9th at 6.30 p.m. Don't miss that. Uh, junior High Christmas Party this week. I believe that's at the Nagel's home right off the of Eagle Road. And there's Philippians Village Missions uh, two th 2018, February 25th th through March 10th, if you're interested. Uh, 
And here's what we plan to do. We plan to bring a team of young and old to this primitive village to participate in a variety of ministries, outreaches ranging from medical ministry to sporting competitions to child evangelism. And go to the table in the hall for more information. I think that covers it. <laughs> okay. yeah, well, we invite you to uh, be part of our prayer chain. If you have requests, to uh, forward those requests to the prayer chain. And we have prayer partners up here after service today, too. I want to share a verse with you this morning. Since it's Thanksgiving week still, and uh, the Apostle Paul was always great at giving thanks, and this is from 1 Thessalonians 1. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only you not simply with words, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of a severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, and the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Wow. What a vision for us, right? And let's, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you for this fellowship of believers. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that our faith would become renowned and that our love would be everlasting and that our hope would be in your promises, Lord. And we ask for your blessing this morning. We ask for you to move among us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to work in our brother Michael this morning, and we ask you to teach us through him this morning. Open our hearts to the truth of your word, Lord. Open our minds to your wisdom, Lord, and fill our speech with grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, every now and then we've, uh, we have the privilege of, uh, or I have the privilege of introducing to you a visiting missionary. I got a call last night, and and, and uh, yeah, it caught me off guard. Uh, you, uh, somehow we got our wires crossed. It's been a crazy couple months for us. And um, well, Stuart and Stephanie spent quite a bit of time with us serving. They were real, if I could use the expression, workhorses. Whatever needed done, they would do it. They'd do the sign ministry. They, would do, they did a lot of stuff helping us out for quite a while here at Calvary Eagle, and Stuart felt the call to be a pastor. And as time went on, he found out this organization called Village Missions, where they train you up and send you in a rural area where they can't really afford to pay a pastor full-time, and so you got to raise support like a missionary. And so we've been supporting Stuart and Stephanie in, in their in the internship. Uh, they first spend a year at another Village Missions church, and after that year, they will be assigned to another church of their own. Uh, right now, they're, st they're in waiting, waiting for their assignment. So I asked uh, Stuart to come on up and share a few words just so you get to know them. And uh, they're one of the many missionaries that we give monthly support to. Stuart, why don't you come up? Stephanie, you come up too. This mic might more so be your height. But... Yeah, yeah, we just bend yeah. it up. There, there, there we go. It's hard to find Mike's his height. <laughs> well, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces again this morning. We're, we're back for the week. We drove back on Wednesday. We drove over to spend uh, Thanksgiving with family. And last Sunday, I almost made the mistake of saying it's the time of the year to be thankful because we can always be thankful. There's always something to be thankful for, <laughs> especially for those of us that know Jesus Christ. We always be thankful for what he did for us on the cross and for what he's doing every day in our lives. So we can, we can always find things to be thankful for. So it's a great time of year, and we're, we're glad to see a lot of familiar faces. And hopefully, if we haven't met you yet, that'll change soon. We're looking forward to getting to know, getting to know all you guys. But like Mike was saying, we, 
we, uh, we did serve here for a little over a, a year. We had the privilege of hanging out with you guys and serving God here for a little over a year. And then we heard of an organization called Village Missions, which I don't want to confuse you with the thing going on in the Philippines because the, the Village Missions organization that, that we're a part of uh, is in America and then also in Canada. So the goal of Village Missions is to, to send pastors to rural areas, like Mike said, that can't afford to pay a pastor. So we started off uh, the past year, we've been over at Camp Creek Church, which is over in the Springfield, Eugene area over in Oregon. And that's been a blessing. Mostly, I think, I think we've shared with some of you guys that it's kind of like when we, when we left here, when you spend about a year getting to know the community and you start to love the people and then you got to move again. So we, we love everybody over at Camp Creek Church now. So we're excited for the future that God has for us. But we're also going to miss the people there, just like we, we miss you guys here. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is great to see, see a lot of familiar faces again. And uh, just the, the past few months, we, we had a VBS summer, so that was a blessing. And then for Halloween, the Halloween season, we, we did what's called a, a harvest party, which is a, a blessing. We have a huge tent set up outside, and we have all kinds of booths where we... Where we share the gospel and we have all kinds of games and there there was a over 10 different kinds of chili because i'm sure we all know that christians like to eat a lot of food and then the, just this past week we had a uh, thanksgiving meal after the sunday service so it kind of sounds like i'm advertising a lot of good food but we do tend <laughs> to eat a lot <laughs> so we had that last sunday and then this this past week we had our official what they call candidate school which is kind of a week of orientation and learning lots about village missions and that kind of concludes the uh, the internship so our internship is officially over now we had our commissioning service which was thursday evening of of this past week so so we are officially now waiting to find out within probably the next couple weeks where where god's going to be sending us uh, next and everybody kind of likes to ask, where, where do we want to go? But we're open, and we trust God that he'll send us just to the right place. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to pray for us, we'll soon find out where we'll be going next. So we're, we're mostly excited, but also unsure of some of that information. So that about is kind of just an overall summary of what has been happening the, the last couple months. But if you guys would like more information or if you would like to partner with us like mike said there's some support that goes along with the job so if you're interested or feel like partnering with us you can come visit us after the service is over and we'd like to talk to you so god bless you guys let's, Let's get some of our folks to come lay hands on them. Let's pray God's perfect will for where they're going to be placed next. So uh, if, you, if you know how to pray, you love to pray, come lay hands on them. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for Stuart and Stephanie and their servant's heart. And how they have faithfully served here, and now for a whole nother year they've served at another church. Lord, they have poured their hearts out and their lives out for you. We pray for a divine appointment of a perfect matchup. Where, Lord, I know that the people in Village Missions, they have to figure this all out where to go. But Lord, I pray you oversee the process. And that you place them in a perfect fit right where it would be family, that they'd know that they found their home, and that the folks uh, in the church that they go to um, move into, that they would receive them warmly. Lord, I pray protection against all the typical things that happens in the, when that there's a change of pastor or a new guy coming up, or people want to compare the pastor to somebody else. But Lord, I pray that they would just, with open arms, receive both Stuart and Stephanie and love them, and that it would be just an instant match. And so, Lord, oversee the process. Protect them from wrong decisions or wrong placement. I know that there could be a wrong place to send them. And so, Lord, let it be your perfect will where they go and uh, that there'd be 
it just be obvious to all that this was a match made in heaven. So bless our brother and sister. Give them wisdom. Give them courage. Give them um, the strength they need to, to face the typical things of what it takes to pastor and to oversee a flock. And Lord, just bless them with your presence above all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we love you guys. We're glad you're here. They'll be sticking around after church. If anybody wants to talk to them and know a little bit more about Village Missions, you're welcome to join them. All right. Here we go. We got our screen, our projector. It looks like we're back up and running, huh? You can't keep, you know, you can't keep a good man down, they say. Well, there's a story behind that. <clears throat> All right. Listen, would you open your Bibles with, with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? We're going to finish the chapter today. And, you know, it's quite a simple title, How to Have Communion. But it's kind of a, a plan of words, I hope you recognize, because it's not just participating in the communion elements. But communion is having communion with the Lord and having communion with one another, having deep fellowship. And I really, I, I chose to call this a simple title, of How to Have Communion, because people miss that. They just go through the ritual, sit, stand, kneel, make the sign of the cross. You know, maybe you've been to churches like that. You go through the motions when it's all over with. You go, what was that? Well, Paul had some corrections to make in the, in the uh, church of Corinth. As you remember, the church of Corinth had several difficulties, and Paul was writing the letter of 1 Corinthians to deal with their, their diversions from the truth, their difficulties they were having. And um, last Sunday, we even dealt with a little bit of controversy. I don't know how many of you guys uh, were here or what you felt about it, but we talked about God's authority structure in life. And if you've got 1 Corinthians 11 opened up, look at verse 3 just to stir the pot again if you missed it. Uh, verse 3 says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, I, if you missed it, I want you to know we, we taught this properly. The head of every woman isn't the, every man. Okay? Men aren't in charge of you. Okay? It's talking about in the family. The head of a woman is her husband. We, we put that in proper context. If you missed it, you go online and, and listen uh, to that message. Now, Paul started out chapter 11 with a, a commendation, an acknowledgement uh, to the Corinthians that they're, they were teachable and they were following his instructions for the most part. Look again in chapter 11, verse 2. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Now some people get upset when you hear the word traditions. No, we're about the word of God, not church tradition. Well, what Paul was talking about was the, the instructions that he's given them from the word of God and that they're following it. They're, they're teachable. Boy, it's so important to have a teachable church. It's so important to be a teachable person. I mean, what if you're wrong about something? Are you one of these kind of people going, well, that's the way I've always done it, so that's the way I'm going to keep doing it until I die. Well, die wrong then, right? I mean, God help us to be teachable so that if there's something wrong in either our behavior, our doctrine, our traditions, that we'll be willing to be teachable and to, be, to adjust to that. But in, in the text today, Paul kind of changes his tune. Our first verse is verse 17. Look at it. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. Verse 2, he says, I praise you. Now he says, well, now what I'm going to talk about next, I got no praise for you at all, okay? And so he's meaning that the Corinthians are really blowing it in this next issue that he's going to talk to them about. So I think that if we want to be teachable, if we have long-standing beliefs or actions or traditions that need to be changed, we need to be willing to listen to the Lord. Amen? So let's bring this to him right now in prayer. Father, make us teachable. Lord, help us that if there's anything in our life, whether it's doctrinally, whether it's traditions or patterns of life, states of mind that you want to change in us, we want to be clay in your hands, Lord. You're the potter. We're the clay. Make us teachable. And Lord, as we go through this, this text, if there's something that you want to change in our life, you are Lord. You are God and I am not. You're in charge. Have your way in our lives. And we, we pray that you give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, again, verse 17. 
Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together for, excuse me, so since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. How'd you like to be told that by the apostle? You know what? You guys are worse off meeting than not meeting. That's pretty bad. As a matter of fact, I looked it up in a couple of different translations. The Phillips translation says, it seems that your church meetings do you more harm than good. How'd you like to, how'd you like to go to a church like that? I hope nobody could say that here. You know, I was walking with the Lord, doing great. I went to that church. Now I, I just, I'm out of it now. I don't even know what's true anymore, huh? That's pretty bad news here, okay? Now, what could the problem be that Paul would talk so severely to them? Now, let me tell you ahead of time, and then we're going to read the text, and you'll see, because I've been poring over this text and trying to understand it, because there's some things I caught that I haven't caught before. So the best I could understand it from reading this and then studying uh, the customs, the commentaries, uh, that the Corinthian Christians were trying to model their communion service after the Passover meal. Because you think, why would they have this love feast, this great big get-together and communion mixed together? You know, we, we always have communion after the service, separate from the potluck, right? But the best I could figure it, nobody's actually said this, but from connecting the dots, I think they're trying to copy the Passover supper, which Jesus' last meal with the disciples was celebrating the Passover. And it was an actual meal. They ate, and it says in the text, if you go and look at it in the Gospels, after supper, he took the bread and he took the wine, and that's when he instituted it, right there at the dinner table. So I think they're trying to copy that. And, uh, you know, by the way, Passover is such a beautiful picture of what Christ did for us. Uh, if, if you haven't, and one of these days, I'm going to bring in like a, a, a messianic fellowship to demonstrate that for you. I just don't think we're set up for it yet. I don't want to do it on a Sunday morning. But they, they go through the Passover, how everything at the table was symbolic of, first of all, it reminded you of what the, the Jews' deliverance from Egypt and and. Everything at the table was something to speak about the great deliverance from Egypt. And then later, uh, then, then Jesus changed the meaning of each item to now represent Christ. And the greatest deliverance of all time is Jesus. And so the problem with this, uh, with the Corinthians, doing it, they were Gentiles, not Jews. Okay, And they were having sort of a potluck before the communion. And, and it got a bit twisted, first of all, because it really wasn't a pastor over, over Seder at all. It was just... A, a pagan potluck, you know, well, they weren't pagans, they're Christians. But second, because of who they were and how it worked out, selfishness took over. And, and instead of a, a potluck the way it could have been, it was a mess because, see, when, when people brought, we just put all our food out there, and if you've ever been to our potluck, which is supposed to be today, but we canceled it because of Thanksgiving, uh, we're all too fat already, right? We we'll just canceled one month. Uh, we, everyone puts their food out there and everyone helps themselves. The way they did it is kind of like a picnic. Everybody brought their food and sat down and ate their own food. And of course, the rich people had caviar and lobster and steak. And not really, but whatever they had was good. And the poor people sitting there chewing on an old piece of bread, you know. And it just, it, it turned out wrong. The, 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 the uh, rich people were eating well and there were poor people in the church. Some of them were slaves or servants, and their, their master was sitting over there eating a good meal, and they're sitting there chewing on a bone, you know. Let me just read it to you uh, from the New Living Translation. kind of puts it, it, it explains it in the light of what I just said. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. And to some extent, I believe it. We'll skip verse 19. Verse 20, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meals without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. See, get the feel of it? And so in the light of the way they did potluck and try to, try to combine it, like a, they called it a love feast, but there wasn't a whole lot of love being shown here. Um, by the way, now you know why we have potluck last. You know, we have our communion, and we make everybody put their food on the table, and everybody gets to eat everybody else's food. <laughs> I know who the good cooks are, so I go right to their dishes, right? Okay? <laughs> so at first, 
I thought Paul was being sarcastic about this next phrase. Look at verse 18. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and that in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, I thought he was being sarcastic. Well, I used to when I'd read this. Like, oh, you've got to be divisions so everybody know who the important people are. You know, like he was ribbing them. But as I'm looking at this more carefully, I've come to believe that what Paul was really saying is when people are at their worst, the cream rises to the top. Oh, there's got to be problems and division among you so that God can identify who the real Christians are. You know what I mean? Matter of fact, your, your first fill-in, you've been waiting for your fill-in, right? Your first fill-in is this. When the majority is walking in the flesh, take note of who is walking in the spirit, and you will identify the mature Christian. You know, I love it. There's, we've gone through a few already in our, in our six or seven years of existence. We've seen some divisions where people try to rise up and be big shots. And you can always tell the carnal people just kind of follow right along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the mature people go, no, no, hold on a second. You know, the mature people with discernment are always the ones who stick around and Keep their eyes on the Lord, and, and, and you can tell there's a difference here. Now, verse 19 says, There must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, doesn't that make more sense in that light that those who God is going, you're doing it right. When there's problems, the mature people stand out as they're not going to be caught up in that division. They're not going to be caught up in the gossip. Did I tell you, my wife and I, our regular prayer is we pray against the critical spirit, the pointing finger and the wagging tongue. I've told you about that, huh? Matter of fact, join me in that. Because those are the three things that destroy churches. The critical spirit, the pointing finger, the wagging tongue. How come he does it like that? What what is he who does he think he is? And what is the what does the pastor do? And nah, 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 nah. You just gotta keep your eyes on Jesus and stop that critical spirit, okay? Now, verse 20, Paul says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. What he's saying is, I don't know what you think you're doing, but this isn't the Lord's Supper. You know what I mean? He's saying, I know, I know what you say it is, but it's not the Lord's Supper. Verse 21, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and the other is drunk. Can you imagine that? People getting drunk at church. Okay. That's why we, we, we say, well, by the way, some of you may be offended by this, but we've made a rule that whenever there's a church event, we don't allow alcoholic beverages. Now, I know it's not a sin for you to have a glass of wine, okay? But I just think we'll keep it clean, okay? When there's a home Bible study or with anything that under Calvary Chapel Eagle, if it's an official church activity, we'll just, you could leave your wine at home, okay? You'd like to have a, 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 a bottle of beer now and then, that's between you and the Lord, but we won't do that at church activities. This will never <laughs> happen at the Calvary Eagle thing, okay? Uh, so he says, for in eating, each takes his own supper, and the others uh, ahead of the others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I shall not praise you. You know, this letter is filled with all kinds of potpourri you know there's times he goes thumbs up man you guys are doing it right here and then he gets to another part of the letter here's something i'm not real happy with but you know and that's really by the way every church is like that if you're looking for the perfect church keep looking because it ain't us you're going to find some things you like and find some things you don't like and that's just the way it is okay if you get to know me there's going to be things you won't like about me i can't imagine what it might be but okay <laughs> A little insight from David Gusek about this. He said, ancient culture, much more than modern American culture, was extremely class conscious. It was re respect of these class divisions that grieved Paul so much. In that day, at, a common, at common meals, it was expected that the upper class would receive better and more food than the lower class. This cultural custom was carried over into the church. And the Christians weren't really sharing with one another at the agape feast. That's what they called it. The rich brought more food and the poor brought less food. But in Corinth, they were not sharing their food fairly. See, so that gives you a little bit better picture 
of what was going on there. Now, Paul will remind us uh, what the focus of our communion time really should be about. Verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, he's going to tell us about the communion service, and he's going to say, you know, by the way, uh, just spoiler alert, communion is all about Jesus, huh? I'm just telling you right now. You want to know what communion is? It's all about Jesus. It's so we don't forget what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. And by the way, something interesting that I, I didn't realize, again, when you, if you ever want to really know a text, teach it. Because when you study to teach, you discover things you never knew before. Here's another one. Uh, I didn't realize that the, the scholars actually debate over the exact meaning of the first part of verse 23. <coughs> because when, when Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, some say he received a vision, he received a revelation from Jesus about communion. Others say, no, he just, he was a friend of Luke, a traveling companion of Luke, and Luke wrote it in his gospel, and Paul just knew about it from the Lord that way. And, and, and so, personally, I, I think this is a great opportunity to explain something to you, that both situations would have the exact same authority. But let me ask you, what would have more authority in your life? If the Lord Jesus appeared to you in person and said, gave you some instructions of what to do and what not to do? Or you read it in the Bible, and the Bible says, don't do this, but do that. It's the same. And when you read the Bible, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, you didn't get a, need a revelation from Jesus on that, right? Okay? And so you could say, you know, the Lord Jesus revealed to me I'm not supposed to commit adultery, or steal, or lie, or go through the commandments. Everything in the Bible, it carries the same authority, folks, is if you got a revelation, that's what really ticks me off. People really love to get revelations from God. And, and, and I'm thinking, hello? Not that, not that God doesn't get it. God can speak to you by revelation, and he does. But I'll tell you something. People start shying away from the Bible. I, we had a, a, recently somebody sent us a message saying, oh, this person had revelation from God, and they said this, and they said that. You've got to watch these videos and pass it along to everybody. And I'm thinking... Why don't they just teach the Bible? And it was weird stuff. Okay, I'm not going to get into too much more. But there, there's, there's weird things going on out there, folks, where people, people would rather read a book about somebody who God took them to heaven and then God took them to hell and then God showed them this and God showed... People would rather read that book than the Bible. That's wrong. The Bible is our authority. So beware of all the... Because people want goosebumps. Beware of the, the new things, the new prophet, the new vision, a new revelation. And so, anyway, I'm going to get off on this, right? <clears throat> but I, it just hit me when I realized people are debating over verse 23, whether it was a revelation from Jesus or he just heard it from Luke. It's, they would both carry the same uh, authority. Which, by the way, there's your next fill-in. Read your Bible as if God is speaking personally to you. Because the Bible is God's word to you. Okay? And I think that's the way we need to read our Bible. This is authoritative. This is Jesus speaking to me. This is God giving me revelation. He's given it to me through his word. So take it on the same level as if you had a personal revelation from heaven, okay? Because that's the authority it carries with it. Now, the last part of verse 23, he says, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. Now, <clears throat> by the way, when we're going to look at this Passover meal, I want you to know, and, and it, it wasn't just happenstance. They happen to be, a, you know, I'm going to die pretty soon. I better give them some kind of symbol. Hey, this bread, I am the bread of life, and this, I, this bread is given to you for you. And this, Hey, here's a glass of wine. He wasn't just making up something. I'm, like I told you, the Passover meal was very significant. YouTube it sometime and watch, maybe from a Messianic fellowship, a demonstration of what that Passover meal meant to the Jew and what the Passover meal also pictured for us today of Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Verse 24, we'll keep reading here. And when he had given thanks, he broke it at the Passover meal. Take, eat. 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. By the way, that bread was, a, was symbolic of something of their deliverance from Egypt. And it was unleavened bread because it was baked in haste, didn't have time for yeast to, to, to rise, and they just ate in haste. And it was a, it's a picture of Jesus because leaven always represented sin in the scriptures. And Jesus was without sin. And so this was unleavened bread. It was a good picture of Jesus Christ. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper. See, it was, that's why the Corinthians do it with after supper. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now keep in mind that one of Paul's closest traveling companions, as I told you earlier, was Dr. Luke. And Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. And Luke's account of this is almost identical to what I just read to you from Paul. Let me, uh, let's look at it in Luke chapter 22. When Jesus, re excuse me, when Luke records Jesus at the Last Supper. Luke twenty two nineteen, 19. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Verse 26, back in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, there's something we need to deal with here. Because if you're a student of church history, you realize this was a big debate among the reformers and against the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church uh, teach, and even to this day, they teach what's called transubstantiation, where they, they taught that the, the bread at a certain part of the Mass actually turned in to the literal body of Jesus Christ. And the, the cup was turned into actual blood of Jesus Christ. And so when they would have the bread and have the cup, I remember as a young boy, I was raised in the Catholic Church, that they wouldn't let you touch it. Don't touch. The priest would go, don't touch, open your mouth. And he'd put it in your mouth. Because God forbid that I would touch the body of Jesus, the priest could only touch it. It was kind of weird. And, and then uh, they didn't have, um, they didn't pass around a cup, only the priest drank from the cup, because the cup, turned into the actual blood of Jesus. God forbid he give it to you and you spill it on the ground, the blood of Jesus. You know what? Once you get a little bit of weird doctrine, it gets weirder and weirder as it goes along. And so believing that it, because Jesus said, this is my body. And so, you know, when we have communion at the Lord's table, we're proclaiming the gospel because in verse 26, he, he says, um, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. When we have communion, we're saying, I believe Jesus died for me. His body was broken for me. His blood was shed for me. And I want to be a part of that. I want to receive the sacrifice that he made for me. We're not actually eating and drinking his blood. And uh, <clears throat> you know, it's funny. What we're doing is we're remembering the Christ of Christianity. I love communion because it points us back to the cross. It points us back to what Christianity is all about. It's not about, you know, as my pastor in California used to say, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do, you know. <laughs> it's not you're a goody good and you don't do this and you don't do that, but you do this and do it. It's not about your code of action. It's about Christ on the cross paying the price for my sins and yours so that those who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so... Communion points us back, and you know, we need reminders. Once a year, the Jews would have Passover. We, we do it once a month. Some churches do it every week. We do it, by the way, every week on Wednesday night if you come to our midweek. But I think we should be reminded all the time. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's not about this. It's not about that. It's about Jesus. It's about what he did on the cross. So we're, we're always being brought back. But it's funny, the debates that went on, during the Reformation, you know, we just celebrated the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. So I went back and I started studying uh, and listening to different lectures of church history. And, boy, I learned a whole lot. And it's like Luther, he came out of the Catholic Church as a priest. So he saw something was a little wrong with this. Most of the Reformers, they Reformed, but not enough. 
you know, they were still on the payroll for the Catholic Church, or they still had a lot of the, a lot of the same, um, uh, what do you call it, beliefs and practices of the church that were off. And so Luther changed it. Instead of transubstantiation, he called it consubstantiation. It doesn't become the body and blood of Jesus, but the body and blood of Jesus are with the elements. Okay, and then later, of course, Zwingli or Calvin, they'd make it more and more spiritual until finally you get what we believe. We're remembering Jesus. We're, we're signifying that I believe in the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for me, and I want to become a part of that. I want to per- receive the benefits of that sacrifice. So I take the communion elements. You know, the, the, by the way, as a Catholic, I remember that if you weren't in good graces with the church, they would refuse communion to you. You know what that means. You don't get Jesus. How about that? You don't stay in good graces with me. I won't let you have Jesus. If you ever want to see Jesus again. Because <laughs> it got weird, okay? And so, so we have communion just to remember, as Jesus said in verse 26 here, that you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. matter of fact, verse 25, it says that you do this in remembrance of me. And, and it's not, and Jesus says it's in remembrance. It's not, as often as you do this and drink this, you're eating me. You know, it's just, okay, I'll get off of it. But I believe Jesus cleared this up in John chapter 6. And, and if you're in small groups, you're going to read the greater section of this text and discuss it. But right now, let me just give you the beginning and end of it. Uh, in John chapter 6, verse 53, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, and he's speaking to the crowd here, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, you imagine what kind of ruckus that would cause. They'd go, he wants us to eat him? And, and they were arguing among themselves. It even says that many, in, in matter of fact, John 6, 6, 6, interesting. John chapter 6, verse 66, says many turned and followed Christ no more. So it caused a big ruckus, and they were arguing, what does he mean? What could he mean? We have to eat him. And, and the Jews, of course, because you're not supposed to drink blood or eat human flesh, they were really upset at this. And somewhere in the conversation, in your small groups, you're going to study it more in depth. In verse 63, Jesus hits it on the head, he nails it. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. I'm not talking about really eating my flesh. I'm talking spiritual. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. I'm giving you a spiritual allegory that you need to receive of me. And so, you know, you could take this doctrine around with it, and it just gets weird. Uh, a new commentary I just added to my collection, John Phillips, uh, says this. Paul's particular concern in this passage was that the people understand two things. First, that they understand the significance of the Lord's Supper, uh, verse 23 through 26. Then, that they would understand the seriousness of the Lord's Supper, verse 27 through 30. The significance, I hope you've seen by now, is that Christ is our Passover. That we don't celebrate Passover anymore like the Jews did. You know, they were celebrating uh, the greatest deliverance of all time. I'll I'll share that in a second here. Uh, When we have communion, we're we're remembering that our salvation comes from what happened on the cross. We're remembering the cross of Christ. Now here's your next fill-in. I almost said this because I know what's in my notes ahead of time. It says, when the Jews celebrate the Passover... They were remembering and acknowledging the greatest deliverance of all time until the cross. They're remembering the deliverance in in Egypt, right? But now, when we share communion, in communion, we are remembering and acknowledging the greatest deliverance of all time, period. There's not going to be a bigger one coming, okay? The Jews, it was a picture of what was to come. It was the greatest deliverance of all time looking in the past, but the greatest deliverance of all time, folks, is our deliverance from sin and from bondage of Satan and sin. And it it happened at the cross, and there's never going to be another one. The communion table replaced Passover Seder. There's going to be nothing that's going to replace that. We're going to always be having communion to remember that, okay? Now, so we looked at the the, uh, significance, as uh, John Phillips said, 
And now let's look at the seriousness of it in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of our Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I want you to notice here, before we go too much further, what Paul is not saying. He's not saying, whoever is unworthy and eats the cup or drinks, uh, eats, eats the bread and drinks the cup. If you're unworthy, you're, you're bringing judgment on yourself. We're all unworthy, okay? He's not saying, you've got to be worthy to take communion. I mean, I was thinking about the man who wanted his daughter healed, and he says, uh, I, and, and he, the people were trying to get Jesus to go to his house. He goes, oh, I'm not worthy if you come under my roof. Just speak the word, and I'll be healed. My daughter will be healed. It's like, we're all unworthy. Nobody's worthy for Jesus. Nobody. Well, if you're good enough, you know, you've got to be temple worthy, and then you could, you could be right for God. You, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags before him. That's what the Bible says. Okay, so Paul's not saying, and the King James kind of is misleading in this by the way. It sounds almost like you've got to be worthy to take communion. But I want you to notice that it actually says in an unworthy manner. They were just, they were just, the whole service, the communion service was a greedy, selfish, who gets the food first and who's going to drink the most wine. It was the unworthy manner, okay? Because we are not worthy, you know, I, I tell you how many times I got to tell you, Second Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so the only way we become righteous is the imputed righteousness of Christ. Folks, I'm going to just tell you that I got nothing to brag about except Jesus. I brag about him. I boast in the Lord. And I, when I stand before him in judgment, I'm not going to cowl away in fear because you know what? He took my sin on the cross, and he was treated the way my sin deserves to be treated. So that as I put my faith in him, he gives me his righteousness, and I'm treated by God the way his righteousness deserves to be treated. Man, that is, that's John 3.16 on steroids. Second Corinthians 5.21, memorize it. It's a, it's a good verse, okay? So the problem with the Corinthians was that they were taking communion in an unworthy manner. Once more, allow me to read you from another a modern translation that kind of words it, it nails it. The message translation says this. Any, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be a part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. If you give no thought, or worse, don't care about the broken body of the master when you eat and drink, you're running the risk of serious consequences. So here's the thing. We're going to have communion in a few minutes. And when we do, it's not like you have to be worthy or you don't get it. None of us are worthy. You confess your sins to him. Get right with him. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Come to him as, a, as someone who has sinned in need of forgiveness, just like any of us, and he will receive you. But don't do it irreverently. You know, you think, you know, people act weird. When they, it's not like eating the, a bag of nuts. This is a special time to remember Jesus and to reverence him. Now, what might those serious consequences be? Look at verse 30. Interesting. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That means if you take it irreverently, you'll fall asleep in church. No, that's not what it means. It's actually talking about death, okay? One, one pastor I listened to says, you know, we're talking about a dirt nap here, you know? I mean, so this is, this is serious. And, and I, you know, personally, I believe that the Lord is not, there's some things that are not exactly the same as the early church. I mean, there were some really wild miracles taking place. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira well, when they dropped dead right before the apostles because they lied? Uh, I think if, if the Lord was still operating exactly like that, there'd be more people dying during communion service. Okay? So I'm grateful to a degree that, that we're not experiencing the same intense judgment, but I still believe that there is consequences. There are consequences 
for taking the Lord irreverently and for taking communion irreverently. There's still truth about serious consequences to what I would call sacrilegious trifling. Listen to what Galatians says. Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh, of the flesh, will reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You know, the way you sow and reap, the way you live your life, there are consequences. And I'm not trying to put a hocus-pocus scary thing that, you know, if you're not right with God and you take this cup, you will drop dead right here. No, no. But, but Paul's saying that's what has happened in his day. Some have actually died because they were, as you've already seen the picture of how carnal the Corinthians were doing this, there were people who were sick and even dead because of this. So keep that in mind when you are tempted to joke about spiritual things. Um, now, if somebody took communion in an irreverent way and they died, does this mean they lost their salvation? Now, come on, keep in mind, Paul's not threatening their salvation in a situation like this. As a matter of fact, look at verse 32. He says, um, when they were judged, when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. I, I really believe that God, you know, God doesn't just, you just step out of line, you lose your salvation. God says, look, you're my kid. You step in a line, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to chasten you. You might get sick. I might call you home early. You, you might have some problems. There's times in life, did you know that some of the things you deal with in life are God's chastening? So that you'll learn a lesson, repent, and get right with him. So you don't have to be judged with the rest of the world. You're God's kids. He's going to deal with you as his kids. You parents, have you ever punished your kids? I don't want to hear how. There's all kinds of crazy stories. But the Lord knows how to deal with us when we step out of line. Uh, it was just severe chastening. <coughs> uh, that's not severe chastening. I don't, I don't think I'm being punished because I had a cough. Okay. Now, what's Paul's suggested solution to this whole thing? It's found in the next few verses. Verse 31, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Look at verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. You know, by the way, that's not a bad idea at the potlucks either. Get first in line and eat everything. You see the people at the end got a couple of meatballs on their plate. And the people in the front of the line got the, all the good stuff. You know, not a bad idea. Uh, but if anyone's hungry, let them eat at home, lest you come together for, for judgment. You know, it's funny. I don't always do this, but I try to practice that don't come to our midweek potluck hungry. Sometimes I do. Because if I come hungry, um, I'm, I'm circling that table. Just, you know, so I, 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 you're the pastor, Mike. You can't do that. You can let people eat. and You got to take some self-control here, okay? But, but I like what he says, the last line here. He says, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Just by, by the way, Paul's saying, there's other things I need to talk to you about, but I'll talk to you when I get there. So Paul had a whole list of things he needed to deal with with the church. Now, here's some things for your final, I think this is your final fill-in. Let's determine, number one, to understand the significance of communion. Okay, It's remembering the cross. It's the Christian Passover. It's Jesus dying on the cross for us. When we have communion, we're remembering the most important thing in the world is the cross of Christ. And number two, let's take the cross seriously. Your last fill-in, I'm going to read uh, one more verse or section of Scripture, then we're going to have communion together. When you have communion, I told you, it's the gospel proclamation. Didn't Jesus say you're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes? Paul said it too. So if we're going to remember the Lord's death, let me just read to you the famous passage, John 3, 16 and 17, from the Phillips translation. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him should not be lost, but should have eternal life. God has not sent his son into the world to pass sentence upon it, but to save it through him. Any man who believes in him is not judged at all. It is the one who will not believe who stands already condemned because he did not believe in the character 
of God's only Son. That's what we're going to look at as we close with the communion today. The character of Jesus, that he so loved us. Greater love has no man than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, Jesus says, if you do what I command you. And so, as faithful followers of Christ, we're going to have communion. And by the way, remember, if you're not worthy, just confess. I'm not worthy. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Name it specifically. You don't have to confess it to the people around you. If there's something you need to get right with him, just say, Lord, forgive me. I know I shouldn't have done this or that. And get right with the Lord so that you can come and receive communion in remembrance of Christ. And by the way, if you're visiting here, the way we do communion is I kind of make you come and get it. Because I figure if you really want Jesus, then come get him, okay? Don't, don't just sit there and go, well, somebody's going to hand it to me. It's kind of an act of faith, saying, I want the Lord, right? We're going to have the band come on up, and we're going to do some worship. And during this worship time, uh, we're gonna, we have two tables in the front, one in the back where the communion elements are. We have a small little container for those of you who need gluten-free, because we don't want anybody to be sick or die during communion. Uh, we have gluten-free in a container on the front right table, and you could take it there. It's a little container like this. And uh, by the way, uh, if you're visiting too, because I've met a couple of visitors today, it's a little tricky. You've got to peel the first lid, gives you access to the bread. The next lid gives access to the cup. And then prepare it. When you grab the elements, prepare it and just wait for further instructions. We're going to all take the communion elements together. Okay? Let's hit the lights. Let's worship the Lord. And after you've confessed your sins, if there's anything you need to get right with the Lord, when you're ready to take the communion in a worthy manner, come and get the elements, take it back to your seat, and wait for further instructions. Let's worship. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Hill, your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross.
holy God, we take this time now to remember what our Savior did to save us. Jesus, you laid your life down for us. We believe that you died on that cross for our sins. We believe that you were buried and you rose again from the dead. We believe that salvation comes only through your shed blood. Not through our works, not through our actions, our attitudes, our behavior, Lord. It's your work, your work on the cross. We look to you now and acknowledge that as we hold these elements before you. And Father, I pray that as we take these elements, that you would just give a fresh cleansing. Yes. If for some reason there's anything hindering us from walking with you, cleanse us by your blood. We recognize that these elements are in remembrance of you. But Jesus, we pray that as we take them, that the true blood of Jesus would cleanse us, that your Holy Spirit would fill us, and that you'd bring us to where we need to be. Lord, even as the song we just sang, lead us to the cross. That we die to ourselves and that we'd live for you. Holy God. Let's do what we've done many times over the years. Let's make a profession of faith before we take these elements. And would you just pray with me by repeating after me, Father in heaven, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose again from the dead. I believe he rose again from the dead. I put my faith in you, Jesus. I put my faith in you, Jesus. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Cleanse me from sin. Cleanse me from sin. Fill me with your spirit. As I take these elements in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the elements together. Thank you, Father. Let's stand and let's offer up one more sacrifice of praise unto his name. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Yeah. 
God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday. And remember, if you do need prayer, our prayer team's up here to your right.